So we wanted to test this now prospectively in a larger sample. So that was a research sample. That's how we developed it in a research sample. So we did a prospective study, right, in 234 consecutive patients coming to our clinic center. Okay? Um, they had a full gold standard evaluation, neuropsych testing, the clinical dementia rating, a neurologic exam, everything. We did all the bells and whistles, right? Um, and so we wanted to test this. And so what we found is if we compared Alzheimer's disease to Lewy body dementia, um, the scores were significantly different. So a score of six versus a score of two, okay? So good discriminator. Even more importantly, if we move a little bit earlier in the disease, if we look at people who have mild cognitive impairment, either due to Alzheimer's disease or to Lewy body disease, three versus one. So that cutoff of three is able to pick up the people who likely have Lewy body disease, okay? And this is true for all of their clinical features. This is true for their neuropsychological testing. This is true for their other core or suggestive features, okay? Uh, so we're able then to test the psychometric properties of the tool to see what, how well it works in real life. Um, so we tested whether it's a valid instrument and whether it's a reliable instrument, okay? Because you can be reliable but not valid. You can be valid but not reliable, right? But you want to be reliable and valid. So we're able to test all of those properties. And so it's a valid instrument. It has really good structure underneath it. Um, you, when you use it in a clinical sample, you get a full range of scores, which is important. If you have a test and everybody only gets two or three scores on the test, it's not a very good test. So you want people to have the full range of scores because then you can really test a population. Um, it has a good relationship with other components of the test. It does a good job of discriminating between diseases. Again, you know, in the order of you know, 93 to 97% discrimination. So very strong discriminative properties. And it works in other cultures. So I collaborated with a group in Korea. So we did the same exact study in Korea, right? So I gave them the tool, they translated it into Korean, they did it in their clinic, worked exactly the same, had the same exact properties. So what did we learn? So we were able to develop a clinical picture and then create a clinical tool that would help the average practicing clinician be able to determine whether the cognitive problems are related to Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia. Last couple of minutes, I'll just mention some things about treatment. So there are no approved therapies for Lewy body dementia. So we use medications from other diseases, okay? So most of what I say in the next couple of minutes is all considered off-label, okay? Because they're not approved treatments. So we can treat the cognitive symptoms of the disease. Um, and so we use the medicines that are available for Alzheimer's disease, the cholinesterase inhibitors. So medicines like denepazil or Aricept, rivastigmine or Exelon, um, Razadine or Galantamine. Um, and so those medicines can be effective at slowing down some of the symptoms. They don't reverse the symptoms, but they can be effective at slowing the symptoms. The data for Memantine or Nemenda is kind of equivocal. We use it, but it doesn't have very strong data in Lewy body disease. For the motor symptoms, we use the medicines of Parkinson's disease with the caveat that when you use these medicines, you increase the potential to have hallucinations. So it's a little bit of a problem. You have to balance out the motor symptoms versus the hallucinations. Okay. For the fluctuations and attention problems, we use stimulants. So we use the medicines that are used for narcolepsy uh, to treat uh, these symptoms. And they can be quite effective at treating those symptoms. But they tend to increase anxiety. So if people have some underlying anxiety, give them a stimulant, they tend to be very, very anxious. And so that becomes a problem sometimes. There are no really good medicines to treat behavior. So my approach is always to try a non-pharmacological approach first. Right? Um, so try to identify a trigger and remove that trigger. And we practice a lot of distract and redirect techniques. Um, so if someone doesn't want to take a bath right now, there's probably no reason why they have to take a bath right now, right? So you can ask them five minutes from now, and maybe five minutes from now, they'll want to take a bath. Or you can run the bath water, 
you know, make it nice and warm and cozy. Say, I just ran you a hot bath. Would you like to take a bath? I mean, so it, it comes down to just sort of, you know, uh, educating the caregiver to try to provide other services, okay? But when you need to use medicines, our first line of approach typically is using an antidepressant. Not just for depression, but for behavior. So there's a number of studies that show now that the antidepressants are as effective for treating behavior as the antipsychotic medications. And they're much safer for the most part. Um, so that's usually our first line. Um, and then we do use some other medicines, but they have, each have problems associated with them. For sleep, uh, we use melatonin predominantly. Um, melatonin works quite well, it's over the counter. Um, and can be quite effective reduce, re reversing a lot of the sleep disturbances uh, in dementia. But if we need to, we can use more powerful medications. <clears throat> For the autonomic symptoms, that's problems with uh, lightheadedness, blood pressure problems, et cetera, uh, there are medicines available. Um, they can work, but they have lots of side effects, so you want to be really careful with them. Um, so we, we try to do this carefully. So right now I'm going to show you two slides for two newly approved medications. Okay. Um, one is for behavior and one is for um, uh, blood pressure problems. Okay. The behavior medicine is not available in the pharmacy. You can't go ask for it. So don't. It's not there. The doctor can't write for it. It's not there. Right. It's, it's under final review before they do all the, the data. It's called pimavanserin, yeah, okay? Um, so it is a non, it's a non-neuroleptic antipsychotic medication, okay? And so it was studied in Parkinson's psychosis, right? So the psychotic features of Parkinson's disease. And what they found was the people who were treated versus the people who were not treated had lower scores on their psychotic scores. It reduced caregiver burden. It reduced the severity of symptoms. It reduced the global rating of symptoms. It improved nighttime sleep and daytime wakefulness. Okay, so very promising. It was only studied in Parkinson's psychosis. So when its final approval will be, that'll be its only thing it's indicated for. Of course, off-label use would vary. Um, but you can't ask for it. Do not go to your family doctor and say, I want my loved one to be on pimavanserin, okay? Because they can't write it, okay? The other one is approved, it, so it is available. It's very expensive. It's very, very expensive, okay? So it's probably not covered by any insurance plans at the present time, okay? Um, and it's called uh, Northera. Its, it's generic name is Droxidopa. Um, and so this is to try to treat the orthostatic hypotension, right? So when you stand up, right, gravity would make all of the blood rush to your big toe. So to counteract that, your body diet, uh, constricts your blood vessels so that the blood doesn't leave your brain. Okay? In Lewy body disease, you don't do such a good job of that. And so when they stand up, their blood pressure drops, they feel lightheaded, dizzy, they can pass out, okay? So there are medicines that are currently available, they have limited utility. So if those medicines fail, there's now this medicine to try to control that, okay? Challenge with this, in its clinical study, it was effective for the first week of treatment and then wasn't so effective after that, okay? But very effective in that first week. Numerically, they were different. So the, the treated group and the placebo group were different, but statistically, they were different. So numerically, uh, they're different, but statistically, they're not, okay? So it's an adjunct medicine. It's an expensive adjunct of medicine. But for people who stand up and pass out, it can be a very effective medicine because if you stand up and pass out, you have a great chance of hitting your head or breaking your hip, and those are bad consequences. So what I tried to tell you over the last uh, hour or so um, was that we were able to use our research data, right? People we followed longitudinally who came to autopsy so that we understood their clinical features and their cognitive features uh, so that we were able to create tools and understand the underlying basis of the disease, okay? 
We developed a tool that would help us uh, help clinicians make diagnoses more readily, um, and we think that would be able to help everybody uh, get early diagnosis. Because if you have an early diagnosis, you can do early intervention. I can always do something for anybody. I can do a lot more for something for somebody at the beginning of the disease than I can at the end of the disease. Um, and so these type of tools that I showed you should help us improve their detection, also help improve enrollment for clinical trials uh, and developing and testing new medications. I want to thank you for your attention.